that very familiar story from the Gospel of Matthew under the sermon title, It Takes a Village. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Splagnitzomai. It's a great word, isn't it? It's Greek to you and me, and it occurs some 25 times in the New Testament. And we just heard one such occurrence in the Gospel. In noun form, splagnitzomai refers to the bowels, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, or the liver. And now I'll bet you wonder, when did I hear Pastor Katie talk about the abdominal cavity during the gospel lesson? Well, here's a clue. Maybe you've heard someplace along the line that in the ancient world, according to ancient thought, the abdomen was the seat of emotion. And what's more, even though we really don't think this anymore, we still talk about sensing something in our gut. Okay, any ideas? Splagnitzomai. It's translated as compassion. To suffer with. To suffer together. Mind you, it's not just sympathy, feeling sorry for something or someone. It's opening oneself up to another's pain. It is joining in suffering. And it's how Jesus experienced the needs of others, time and time again. We've been thinking about parables these past several weeks. Now today and next week, we get to look at a couple of miracles. This morning, I bet you'd heard that story before. Probably one of the most familiar miracles in all of Scripture. And even though the setting and the details differ, this is the only miracle that is found in all four Gospels. So I think it's safe to assume it's important. Now the reasons vary, but for Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it all starts out with Jesus going off to a deserted place, a lonely place. And in Matthew, the precipitating issue is the beheading of John the Baptist. It seems that Jesus needs to withdraw immediately to process this very hard event. And then it happens. A great throng follows him. Jesus himself is a person with the need to grieve, and yet the crowd comes with needs as well. Crowds that are hurting. Crowds that are sick and hungering for Jesus' healing touch. And Jesus has compassion. Splagnitzomai. He opens up to their suffering. He experiences it with them. And Jesus draws from what little spiritual or emotional energy he must have at this point, and he shares it by healing the sick. Night falls. And of course, the crowd begins to get hungry, and the disciples tell Jesus to send them on their way. Let them get their own food. Well, maybe the disciples had been managing the whole day, and they could just see that Jesus was spent. Maybe they were just not able to see beyond the present moment. But Jesus had another idea and another response. Because he knew that the crowd's need was not taking a break, even if his own resources might be depleted. Jesus calls upon the disciples to think bigger, to think creatively. Rather than focus on what they can't do, think about what they can. And it turns out to be pretty meager. Five loaves, two fish. Meager but not nothing, the morsel is brought to Jesus, who blesses it, who breaks it, who returns it to the disciples, and then in turn, they share it with others sitting on the grass. And then we're not really told how, but we learn that everyone eats, and everyone is satisfied. 
5,000 men and women and children. So what is the miracle here? It strikes me that the way we answer that question has a lot to do with the story's impact that it's going to have on our daily lives. Because if we determine that the main point is that Jesus is a wonder worker who can transform one family meal into thousands of picnic suppers, well, then I guess the takeaway is that Jesus is powerful. Jesus does miracles. To be compelled to believe in him because he can take a meager, meager supper and he can multiply it. To believe that Jesus is powerful and amazing. And I don't refute those descriptors. But I also think this conclusion alone kind of lets us off a little too easy. It implies that we can just hand our problems over to Jesus because he can take care of the rest. And such belief certainly requires an intellectual assent. We need to think it in our minds. But it doesn't really require too much else. So what if something else is going on in this story? Something that obliges more of us. In other words, something that doesn't just engage our mind, but also our heart and our soul and our body and our strength. See, viewed somewhat differently, the story engenders awareness, agency, and response on a variety of levels and from all of us. Why meeting the needs of others, it takes a village to be most effective. What's more, it doesn't only happen in our heads. It's not okay to just leave it to Jesus. Helping others begins with a feeling of connection with people and problems around us. And Jesus models from the get-go, splagnitzomai. It cannot be taught or thought. It needs to be felt. Jesus saw others in the village with need, and he was moved. Not because they were his family, not because there was something in it for him, simply because he had compassion. He operated under that premise of, I can do something, I should do something. And as a result, throughout his life, Jesus touched others. He forged authentic and caring community. He was a beacon to other people. He experienced the richness of agape love that gave purpose and meaning to his every day of his life. So maybe that day, maybe even Jesus had his limits. Maybe in his humanity, Jesus really was physically spent. He had depleted the resources that he had, but not his compassion. He knew that the needs were greater at that moment than one person could provide, and that together they could do more. He knew that it took an entire village, him and his followers, and then more needs could be filled. So he pushed the disciples. He nudged them in the direction of providing out of their resources so that they too might experience all those wonderful blessings of agape love that compassion brings. You bring them something to eat. And then Jesus, he took it. He looked up to heaven like an offering to God. He blessed it. And then he gave it back to the disciples. Did you read that? And the disciples, well, they must have felt something in their gut. Splagnitzomai. Because they didn't proceed to eat the dinner themselves, did they? They shared it. They gave what they had. And maybe others were moved by what they saw going on. And they felt something in their gut. They recognized that they too had some resources to share. See, the next verse, all it says is, all ate and were filled. So maybe it wasn't bread, but it was compassion. 
compassion was multiplied. Somehow, miraculously, there was more than enough food for everyone. And needs were met. And looking at the story from this perspective, why it both reassures us as well as places demands upon us. Because we learn that Jesus is merciful, that he's compassionate, that he's abounding in steadfast love. And thanks be to God, he sees our needs and he addresses them. But the text also calls for a response to participate to recognize that it takes a village to see and address in needs the most effectively, and we are part of that village. You give them something to eat, not because they're part of your clan, not because there's something in it for you, simply out of compassion, splagnitzomai, feeling so connected to the other children of God on this very planet that you suffer with them deep inside. And so know what? You have to do something. This summer alone, I've seen so many examples right here. I think of the funeral committee. We had a funeral here yesterday morning. We had another one the Sunday before. So many times throughout the year. And you come together and you provide food and there are people that come to host and to set up and to clean up. And you know what? It's hours of time. And it's often given on behalf of people that you don't know very well. In fact, you might not even have met them. But you know that a time of grief is when families are depleted. They're empty. So you bring your five loaves and your two fish, and you share them. And I see it all the time. All are filled. People find solace because of your compassion. I think of projects like the Love in Action Backpacks. I think of the Syrian Supper Club that met the needs of refugees. I think of the Women of Covenant in Ethiopia this summer. Just this summer, times in which we brought our five loaves and our two fish together, and Jesus blessed it and broke it, and there was extravagant, amazing Miraculous sharing. It takes a whole village to see the need, to feel the need, and to address the need. It is God's spirit that is planted in us in our baptism, just as it was for little Jasper, quietly asleep, so happy. It happens when we gather around the communion table, as Vanessa will for the first time this morning, to receive the bread and the wine, we receive Christ. He is present within us and we are filled. And then as we go out this door, we are dismissed to go and be Jesus. You give them something to eat because you have been filled with the compassionate love of Christ. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, do you remember this verse? Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these. Yes, you and I can perform miracles in Jesus' name when our compassion is multiplied, splagnitzomai, bringing what we have, offering it to the Lord, and then working together to bring healing, hope, and life to a hungry and hurting world. Now that's what I call a feast. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.